Hi everyone, welcome back to World Civilizations 2. Um, I am Dr. Ross, as a friendly reminder, uh, and I'm going to continue our discussion of the Age of Revolutions today with uh, the Haitian Revolution. Uh, as a reminder, the reason why we are kind of taking these three revolutions in this particular order is not simply because that makes sense chronologically, but because it makes sense thematically uh, as well. When Dr. Haynes first introduced this three-part kind of series, he really focused on the relationship between the ideology of the American Revolution and the way in which it kind of crashed against the practical desires of the revolutionaries themselves. And then I tried to carry that theme through into the French Revolution, where we saw very similar, um, although not exactly uh, the same kinds, of, of conflicts between a desire to grant people liberty, equality, and fraternity, while you know reckoning with a, uh, a simultaneous fear of what the consequences of giving people that liberty and equality would mean, a fear that you know had its most uh, overt outgrowth in what was known as the terror. In neither of those two cases, it is worth emphasizing, did the revolutionaries, at least initially, consider giving rights to women or to people uh, of color. Therefore, when you know, people like Thomas Jefferson claim that our innate, we have inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, what he means is only some people have those rights and not others. Although the Haitian Revolution did very little to advance the cause of women's rights, it did put into practice the ideals of these revolutions for people of color, and particularly, in particular, uh, slaves. Um, and it's that I'm going, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. My argument, in other words, that if you want to look at um, the ultimate kind of fulfillment, or as close to fulfillment as we get in the late 18th, early 19th century of the revolutionary ideals, you do not actually look to America, you don't look to France, instead you look to Haiti, the site of the most important of the three revolutions, because of its ability to demonstrate to the world the ramifications of the ideals that the elites of America and France laid out in the first place. So I begin my lecture today um, not with the story, but with a problem. The problem facing the revolutionaries and the Enlightenment thinkers who inspired them regarding how one can simultaneously claim to be defending the rights of man, the inalienable rights of man, if you will, and still believe that it is just and right and proper to keep slaves. So I open today with this quote from Rousseau, uh, uh, the Enlightenment thinker I mentioned last time, known primarily for his democratic bona fides, right? His emphasis on the, the need for um, society to come together in a general will, and it is in that general will that proper sovereignty lies. In, one, in the most famous line from The Social Contract, the book where he lays out these ideals, uh, Rousseau essentially presents us with a problem. He declares, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. And what Rousseau means, in this, in, uh, 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 means by this is that in a state of absolutism, right, living under a monarchy, we are unjustly put into bondage. That man by nature should be free, but that we live in a society that takes away that freedom unjustly. And it is by this argument that Rousseau essentially claims that absolute monarchy is by definition illegitimate. And that was the argument I made about Rousseau last time. What I want you to think about in particular is the precise language that Rousseau uses to make this claim. Man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. Um, well, if you think about it, uh, I mean, Rousseau wasn't in chains. He was a free man. Uh, although he lived in absolute monarchy, uh, he actually lived most of, you know, wrote uh, uh, a great deal from Switzerland. Um, he published his works. He wasn't arrested. He, uh, for a time at least, uh, inhabited the most elite of, so of French society. 
Rousseau is not in chains at all. Rousseau, in fact, even as he claims that the monarch is keeping him in chains, lives in a society that kept thousands upon thousands of people in literal chains, right? The slave colonies of the French Caribbean. So the question I pose to you is, how can Enlightenment and revolutionary thinkers simultaneously use the metaphor of slavery to complain about their own status, and at the same time defend the existence of systems of slavery within their own societies. Within their own societies. This problem, the, the notion that one can simultaneously claim, I am a slave, while still defending actual slavery, does not go away in the course of the French Revolution. Rather, it remains at the very center of debates that will be ongoing as the French revolutionaries try to figure out precisely what they mean when they declare that man is born free and equal in rights, in the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. The Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, taking up many of the ideas that Rousseau lays out, does not solve this problem. In, instead, it exacerbates it. I pointed out last time that the very first article, that man is born in free and equal in rights, simultaneously claims that there may be social distinctions. What kind of social distinctions? Those based on the common utility. One could argue, as the revolutionaries did, I would not agree with this, that that means that women should be de denied the vote. Revolutionaries argued that women were too emotional to have the vote. And that therefore denying it to them was, a, was in the service of the common utility. The same problem faces those who want to prevent people of color from gaining their given inalienable rights, especially those kept in slavery in the um, Caribbean. The key problem for those wanting to defend the rights of all people is in the very title of the document, the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. Only men can be citizens. Therefore, what is a man. What defines the term man? What gives one the right to classify oneself as a human being endowed with these supposedly inalienable rights? Certainly, one had to be a person of property, one had to be gendered male, and one had to be white. And that was for actually a particular reason. Um, even those who argued against the practice of slavery in the 18th century essentially claimed that people of color and those kept in slavery were not actually men. So, I have an example. This is not from one of your documents. I just pulled it from some of my, my, own, uh, uh, my own textbooks. Um, from an abolitionist society uh, working during the French Revolution itself. In the late 18th century is one of the major high points of the campaign to abolish first the slave trade and then slavery itself uh, within European societies. The French society against slavery and the slave trade was known as the Society of the Friends uh, of Blacks. And they asked the, re the revolutionaries why they should, con or, excuse me, they explained to the revolutionaries why they could, should consider the problem of slavery in the context of the French Revolution. And they argue, if some motive might, on the contrary, push them, the people kept in slavery, people of color, les noirs, the blacks, as they put it in French, to insurrection, might it not be the indifference of the National Assembly about their lot? Might it not be the insistence on weighing them down with chains? Note the, re the recurring metaphor of the chain, but here it's literal, not metaphorical, or not just metaphorical. When one consecrates everywhere this eternal axiom that all men are born free and equal in rights. The Society of Friends of Blacks throw back the very language of the French Revolution at the very people who refuse to free enslaved peoples. And yet, and yet, the Society of the Friends of Blacks did not make the argument that the French revolutionaries should immediately abolish slavery. Why not? 
because they fundamentally agreed with the notion that uh, people of color kept in bondage were not fully men. Later in the same document, the Society of the Friends of Blacks declare that, quote, the immediate emancipation of the blacks would not only be a fatal operation for the colonies, it would even be a deadly gift for the blacks. And let me pause about that term, the blacks. That is a direct uh, 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 translation from the French, les noirs, uh, literally the color black, um, and really could be translated as people of, uh, of color in modern day language. In any case, immediate emancipation would be an even deadly gift for the blacks in the state of objection and incompetence to which cupidity has reduced them, the system of slavery has reduced them, it would be to abandon themselves and without assistance, children in the cradle or mutilated and impotent beings. Paraphrase, let me put that more simply. The Society of Friends of Blacks say you cannot free the slaves because they're children. In other words, they are not men. The <coughs> argument used to justify the continued um, existence of systems of slavery based on race during the revolutionary era is fundamentally that the people so enslaved were not men. And the reason why the Haitian Revolution is so important is that they, it was the first time where black people themselves proved that yes, they were. And the reason that is so significant is not simply that for the, you know, for the first independent, uh, um, uh, independent slave society in history, but also because the themes of the, of the Haitian Revolution and the claims that the people of color of Haiti will make against their French and sla uh, uh, slavers are precisely the same terms that come to us until really today. So here I have an image of um, uh, strike action during the civil rights movement with the placard, I am a man. Uh, note in this particular image, the white um, uh, ally uh, does not have this sign. Why? Because those writing things like the Declaration of Independence took that as a given. But people of color had to prove it. And in Haiti, in the Haitian Revolution, uh, they did so uh, uh, in the terms of Europeans uh, for the first time, although obviously it wasn't really for the first, first time. The language is born of the Haitian Revolution, the ability of the Haitian revolutionaries to use the language of, um, uh, of the Enlightenment and the American and French revolutions proved efficacious for the next 200 years. That's why the Haitian Revolution is significant. Note the key term, significance, uh, which might appear on your uh, next example. OK, so that's why the Haitian Revolution is important. Let me tell you its story. You've already been introduced to uh, the 18th century Caribbean when Dr. Haynes discussed uh, the slave trade. Um, just to orient us to, uh, a little bit, note the complicated political situ situation of the uh, late 18th century uh, Caribbean with Spanish settlements, and these will change hands multiple times through the course of the 18th century. English settlements, especially here uh, in Jamaica and the Bahamas. Um, and then here, the uh, western half of the island of Hispaniola, um, San Domingue, future Haiti. Um, in an exam or a writing response, Haiti and Saint-Domingue will mean the same thing. Feel free to use them uh, interchangeably. Um, we've already been introduced to the importance of the sugar industry within Saint-Domingue, so I'm not going to belabor that point. Rather, I'm going to point to uh, uh, two important aspects of Haitian society, of the society of Saint-Domingue, just prior to the outbreak of the French Revolution. The first thing you need to know about the society of, uh, of Saint-Domingue is, uh, missing a slide, that's okay, is that the social context was incredibly complex. And you need to know about four different groups that comprised the society of Saint-Domingue prior to the French Revolution. First, at the top of the hierarchy, of the social hierarchy, you have wealthy planters, those who owned the sugar plantations in particular, some of whom would own thousands 
of slaves working to enrich themselves or perhaps their families uh, back home. In fact, a lot of these rich planters didn't even live there. They lived, uh, they were absentees. They lived usually, uh, usually in France. So, top of the hierarchy, wealthy planters. Wealthy planters would obviously have an interest in the preservation of the existing social hierarchy. It would be, in some ways, deeply threatened by any change to that hierarchy. There were also a significant population within Saint-Domingue uh, of free people of color. People who had managed to buy their way to freedom, or who had escaped to freedom, or came from elsewhere, but were, well, were non-white, and were able to build a life for themselves, often by creating small farms or larger plantations themselves. Some of the free people of color did, in this context, uh, own slaves. Um, they had a similar in, um, investment in pres preserving certain kinds of hierarchy within San Domain. What the free people of color, however, did not have, despite their relative wealth, despite their relative importance to the economy of Haiti, was political power. Unlike the white planters, whom in many respects they resembled, the free people of color had no um, political sway on the island. At the time of the French Revolution, there were about 24,800 people, free people of color to about 30,000 whites. So, you know, those numbers are about equal. The third major category within Haiti prior to the French Revolution were the slaves themselves. Vastly outnumbering um, those of either the other groups. Um, unfortunately, I had all the numbers and that slide has disappeared, but I will make sure to upload that to uh, the PowerPoint we put on Canvas. The fourth group, poor white people. There was a significant population of white people who had come often from Europe, sometimes from the United States or other European colonies, seeking a better life. And they came to Saint-Domingue because Saint-Domingue was the world's primary sugar producer and was there key to the colonial economy more broadly. However, as Dr. Haynes pointed out, sugar production is really expensive. Really expensive. It's really hard to just get into sugar production. And these uh, poor whites had no interest in working on the plantations because that's the work of slaves. And so there is a significant number of poor whites on the island who lack opportunity for advancement. And perhaps we'll see an opportunity arise with the French Revolution. So, just as a review, in order to understand the Haitian Revolution, you have to keep in mind these four categories. Top of the hierarchy, uh, uh, white planters. Underneath them, free people of color, also fairly wealthy, but lacking in political power. Then, the slaves, the enslaved people of color, working the plantations. And finally, the poor uh, white population, who sought opportunities for advancement, but often did not find them. Now, at the same time, Saint-Domingue is relatively isolated within the Caribbean. And so the first thing I want you to know is the social hierarchy. The second thing I want you to know is just an awareness that Saint-Domingue is a French colony in a sea of other European powers. And indeed, one thing that might happen if you do have a slave revolt is that the slaves here in blue, uh, on the blue part in France, French territory, might seek allies from either Spain or Britain in order to fend off the French. Right? The French own these plantations. If there's a revolt, the slaves might seek allies elsewhere in order to fight off the French. Something to keep in mind as the story uh, progresses. Uh, because, spoiler alert, that's essentially uh, what will happen. Okay, so on the eve of the French Revolution, 
Saint-Domingue remains France's most important overseas colony by far. When the revolution happens, therefore, there is almost no discussion of changing the political and social situation of Saint-Domingue. To do so would be to threaten the very basis on which French wealth was largely built. In other words, the democratizing pressures of the French Revolution did not, did not filter to Saint-Domingue, at least not initially. When news of the revolution arrives in the Caribbean, however, things begin to change almost immediately. In another French colony in Martinique, there was a slave revolt almost instantaneously, as soon as the, um, the, the news arrives. The slaves, in other words, of Martinique knew about the Estates General and knew that there was abolitionist activity in France and thought that they had been freed. That revolt will be put down. In Saint-Domingue, things don't start with the slaves. They start actually with the white planters. That's why you need to know these four groups. The white planters had, before the revolution, been trying to gain more political power vis-a-vis -vis the king. When the revolution happens, they send representatives to France in order to ensure that their interests are represented. Right? So the third estate is throwing out the monarchy. We need to make sure we have a say. Well, it's not just the white planters who have this idea. The free people of color of Haiti as well see an opportunity to give voice to their demands, not simply against the king, but against the rich planters, which had excluded them politically until this point. The free people of color, in other words, will be the first group of this, these four groups to take up the language of the French Revolution and attempt to put it into practice. They will send a representative to Paris to lay down their demands for representation and the right to vote by free people of color, who argued, we might be black, but we are nonetheless citizens. The man who will first do this is named Vincent, uh, Vincent Auger, Vincent Auger um, who happened to be in Paris actually at the time. And when news of the French Revolution broke out, he was able to link up with other free people of color from the colonies and began the process of making demands on the National, um, National Assembly. Auger, the primary spokesman for the position of the free people of color, demands representation within the Constituent Assembly of the French Revolution. The revolutionaries, however, are incredibly uninterested uh, in really changing anything about the, colonial, about the colonial situation. And they do not respond uh, uh, with enthusiasm to the demands of the free people of color. That said, it's important to think about what the free people of color are doing at this moment, almost about, uh, just about a year after the French Revolution breaks out. And this is your document for today, and it's also the document that you have a writing exercise for due next week. The free citizens of color bring to the National Assembly uh, 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 some demands, and they explicitly use the language of the Declaration of Rights of Man in order to do so. They say, they claim the rights of man and citizen, those inalienable rights based on nature and the social contract, those rights that you have so solemnly recognized and so faithfully established when you established as the foundation of the Constitution that all men are born and remain free in equal rights. We claim, in other words, we demand the same rights you grant to free white people. And they implicitly say, there is no logical reason for why you could extend these rights to poor people in France and not rich black people in Haiti. And not rich black people in Haiti. In fact, the free people of color argue that these are the same interests as the white planters. They will easily show, they being the free people of color, they will easily show that the legitimate interests of the whites themselves like those in the colonies, I am guaranteeing the status and liberty of the citizens of color. For a state's good fortune consists in the peace and harmony of its members, its constituent members, 
And there can be no true peace or strong union between a group, strong group that oppresses a weak one that yields, and between a commanding master and an obedient slave. This passage from your document is really fascinating. It's really fascinating for a number of reasons. One is, you have a group of free people of color, of black people, essentially saying, our interests are the same as the whites. These rich planters who want a little bit of political power vis-a-vis -vis the monarchy, we want that too. That's all we want. And in fact, in recognizing that we, free people of color, share the same interests as the whites, that will ensure stability in the colonies. And against whom might you be wanting to um, uh, uh, ensure stability? Against enslaved blacks. The free people of color, in other words, are not making an argument for the abolition of slavery. They're making an, abolition, uh, an argument that they should be granted citizenship in order to maintain slavery. In fact, they use the exact same metaphor as so many white people. Um, there can be no true peace or strong union between a strong group that oppresses and a weak one that yields between a commanding master and an obedient slave. They're not talking about actual slaves here. They're talking about metaphorical ones. So the Haitian Revolution represents not simply a revolt against white people, not simply against a revolt against white planters, but a broader revolt against this notion that one can talk about slavery without actually talking about slaves. And that means a revolt against, uh, at least at first, the free people of color as well. So you can see these demands are being made in 1789 into 1790. Auger, however, finds himself essentially rebuffed by the French revolutionaries. They have no desire to, uh, to, to, to uh, um, rock the boat of the colonies. Um, they do form a committee in order to kind of decide what to do about the colonies, which essentially doesn't even mention race at all. I mean, and on the one hand, the white planters are then able to say, well, it doesn't mention white race at all, therefore black people are excluded. While the free people of color are then able to say, well, it doesn't mention race at all, therefore we're included. So the, essentially, the, the, the problem is not solved. Auger, uh, Vincent Auger, um, frustrated by this, um, goes back uh, to Saint-Domingue um, in order to participate in elections, which, as I just said, was probably not legal. Um, when that didn't work out, he actually gathers um, several hundred friends in one of the major cities of Saint-Domingue and launches a, uh, 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 a revolt against the white planters who control the military forces on the island. Um, he is captured uh, and executed in February 1791 for his efforts. However, his efforts were not in vain. He might have been killed for them, but they were not in vain. His ability to show the ways in which it does not take much to cause instability within the island encourages the revolutionaries back in France to reconsider their position. And in spring 1791, the National Assembly grants citizenship, in other words, the right to vote and all other citizenship rights, to free people of color. May 15, 1791. They do this for a lot of reasons, um, some of which I, I'll, I'll get to, but what I really want to emphasize is the ways in which the decision to expand the meaning of the French Revolution does not happen in France. Just like it doesn't happen in America. It happens in Haiti. Think about what direction is the momentum coming from. It's not coming from these elites over in France discussing what to write down in a Bill of Rights. It comes from the blood of freedom fighters back in Haiti, who force the French to reconsider. The path of the radicalization of these revolutions is not one from Europe to the colonies, it's from the colonies to Europe. The age of revolution, in other words, is not the story alone of men like Thomas Jefferson, it's of men like Vincent Auger, who much more accurately understood what these ideals truly meant. Okay, in any case, uh, the granting of citizenship to free white, uh, to free people of color did not really go over well with our fourth group uh, uh, of, of people on the island, the poor whites. 
they break out uh, uh, because they don't want black people having more rights than they do. Uh, there is a revolt of uh, uh, that group, and the French begin to send the military. And in doing so, they begin to arm the free people of color, who now have a, a way, a, a reason to fight in the name of France, to protect their citizenship. So, what's happening in, by the end of 1791, uh, or let's say summer 1791, free people of color have citizenship rights, they are aligning themselves with social hierarchy, just as the white planters are, and poor whites are encouraging those free people of color to arm themselves. What group is still missing from this story? The slaves themselves. In none of these discussions have actual enslaved people come up. The, the, the revolutionaries have actually no interest in that. The free people of color have no interest in that. The poor whites definitely have no interest in that. And the white planters, I mean, they have the opposite of an interest in that. They want that to just like, you know, not even come up. The slaves force the issue. Let me be clear about that. The story of the most successful slave revolt in history does not come from outside. It does not come from uh, people teaching the slaves what freedom means. It comes from the slaves themselves. In a well-organized revolution that begins in August 1791. The slaves were able to use relative freedom to practice their religion, to meet secretly in the woods and forests of Saint-Domingue. Excuse me. Um, to plan a revolt. In the first two weeks of the rebellion, 23 of 27 parishes in the northern part of Haiti had slave revolts, and 200 sugar plantations and 1,200 coffee estates were burned and destroyed to the ground. This is righteous violence. I mean, let's be clear about that, right? These people, as Dr. Haynes pointed out, were kept in line by a system of intense terrorism that the slaves recognized as fundamentally counter to their own rights as men. And they took it upon themselves to free themselves. I'm about to tell you when, about when the French acknowledged that freedom, but make no mistake, the slaves freed themselves at this moment. August 1791. So, the leader of the movement, or one of the leaders, the most important leader of the movement, was a Creole slave, or excuse me, ex-slave, former slave, he had managed to uh, earn his freedom, um, uh, Toussaint Louverture, um, who led the slave rebellion until his death in 1803. The spread of the slave rebellion changed the political calculation back in France. In unable to gain control over the island with, um, with all this violence, and unwilling to really get um, uh, 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 the white planters to um, you know, cooperate with the free people of color, the, the, constitu the National Assembly back in France had to make, um, had to make a decision. As the French Revolution radicalized, they began to realize that it might actually be better to ensure that the slaves and the free people of color stay on their side, and that in uh, doing so would be more in line with their own radical ideals of mass democracy. In order to prevent the slaves and free people of color from going over to the side of the Spanish, on the other side of the island, in order uh, to defend their well-earned freedom, the French send a representative to the, um, to the island who is authorized to give some concessions to the revolting slaves and free people of color, who have now kind of recognized their shared interest in preserving the, the, the kind of um, uh, uh, relative chaos that is happening. Uh, on the island in order to prevent the reimposition, not simply of slavery, but of white supremacy in Saint-Domingue. The representative of France, the most important one, he goes with a, a couple others, Léger uh, Félicité Sontonax, um, arrives on the island in 1793. And he's not given permission to simply abolish slavery. But once he's on the island, he recognizes the writing is on the wall that these are men who are the kind of sole bulwark that could prevent 
Spain from taking over the most important sugar colony in the world. You need, in other words, the slaves to fight for France, not for Spain. He also, it is worth pointing out, himself was sympathetic to the abolitionist cause. Probably more in line originally with the Society of Friends of Blacks, um, gradual abolition. But seeing the writing on the wall, he declares slavery abolished on August 29th, 1793. First in the northern part of the, the island and then spreading elsewhere. So let me pause, just you know, sum up a little bit. When the slave revolt happens, it is the slaves themselves on their own volition freeing themselves. That creates a, a, a sense of chaos on the island that the French are intent on containing in order to ensure French control of Saint-Domingue going forward. They send a representative, Soldanax, to the island in order to ensure that those interests are followed. And Soltanax realizes that the best way to do so is to declare that slavery is abolished. Again, the slaves were already free. <laughs> they had done, taken that out of the French, France's hands. The slaves were already free. Now, with the abolition of slavery, however, the slaves and their leader, um, Toussaint Louverture, does do, go to the side of the French. And if you, if you go in, I, I say this in every lecture, if you go read the story of the Haitian Revolution, you'll realize that he does fight for the Spanish at first, then he goes back, back and forth. For our purposes, with the abolition of slavery, Louverture uh, joins forces with the French and essentially wins a war against Spain for France in the name of freedom. So the slave revolt is now fighting for France, for the French Revolution. And by 1798, Louverture is essentially in control of Saint-Domingue in the name, mind you, of France. Now, things don't go uh, quite so well for Louverture. There's, there's kind of a civil war between him and an opposing general. But more important for our purposes is the way in which Louverture's and the slave revolt's control over the island is, in the name of France, is threatened by um, uh, events occurring outside the island. So if on the one hand the kind of spread of these ideals in the name of liberty come from the island to France, the attempt to take these benefits away come from France and go to the island. France, put simply, once things are calmed down, decides, you know, this whole abolition of slavery thing doesn't sound so great. We were making a lot of money with the system as it was. And so France, once they win the island with the aid of slaves, with the aid of free people of color, says, actually, I think we need to put slavery back. And the man who's going to try and do that is someone you read about, but I did not lecture on, Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, I'm not going to go into details about how this goes down, except to emphasize, think about what that would mean. These thousands of enslaved people had freed themselves. They had achieved something that no other group of enslaved peoples, at least in the history of modern slavery, had managed to achieve, their own freedom. And the French are going to come in and take that away. They're going to take away that freedom. They're going to reimpose a system where your children will be slaves and their children will be slaves. They're going to put that back into place. And Napoleon is successful at doing this in the other French colonies. He reimposes slavery in Guadeloupe. He reimposes slavery in Martinique. He fails in Haiti. He fails in Haiti. And that is incredibly important, incredibly significant. Napoleon fails not for lack of trying. He sends his brother-in-law, um, uh, Victor Emmanuel Leclerc, I will not ask you his name, his brother-in-law, um, in 1802 to reimpose slavery and establish French hegemony over the island. Um, Toussaint Louverture um, initially resists, but soon agrees to kind of join up with Leclerc, who then betrays him, sends him back to France, and Toussaint Louverture is executed in 1803. With the betrayal of Louverture, he, uh, um, the leaders of the slave revolt, now essentially the leaders of Haiti, recognize that there can be no cooperation with France. 
because France will either kill them or enslave them. And so a war that lasts about one year breaks out between the slaves once again and French forces led by Napoleon's representative. This revolt, or excuse me, this war was incredibly brutal on both sides, on one side perhaps more justifiably than the other. But a combination of disease that ravages the French troops unused to the climate of the Caribbean, combined with the fact that the French troops were incredibly cruel, which turned the entire population against them, leads to their defeat by these formerly enslaved peoples. Sidebar, with the failure of Napoleon's attempt to reassert French hegemony in the Caribbean, he decides that his ability to maintain and hold in the French, in the Americas more generally, beyond Martinique and Guadeloupe, is over, and he decides to sell Louisiana to the United States. So the Louisiana Purchase is actually a direct result of Haitian independence, declared 1804, uh, January 1st. To conclude, uh, just a few words um, about Haiti. Um, I really emphasize the positives of this story, and because I think the positives of this story are worth dwelling upon. That's not to say that Louverture was a good, was a nice man. Uh, he, in fact, uh, in order to get the sugar production back going, uh, reimposed systems of forced labor in Haiti. So the notion of you know pure freedom is is one that I'm using to, in order to draw the narrative but should be recognized as not entirely the case. Um, Haiti is, uh, 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 or has had, incredibly corrupt governments. They, they've had an empire. They've had uh, systems of uh, forced labor that have been incredibly cruel. However, I want to emphasize today, in my way of conclusion, that Haiti's current problems are largely not due to Haiti. Um, and the reason I want to emphasize this, and perhaps spend a few more minutes than I normally do on this, is that Haiti was recently in the news um, as a, quote, shithole country, uh, as declared by the President of the United States. Um, and one re thing, reason I want to uh, address that is that it's important to recognize what creates the conditions for a country like Haiti to be considered such a vulgarity. One reason is that the United States, along with European powers, refused to recognize Haiti as an independent nation, fearing that to recognize a society of freed slaves would encourage revolts at home. They didn't not recognize Haiti because they didn't recognize that it was independent. They didn't want to encourage their own slaves uh, to see freedom as a possibility even though they clearly already did. Uh, the U.S. does not officially recognize Haiti for decades, uh, sometime after the American Civil War. The U.S. will occupy Haiti, causing many of the problems of corruption that remain today. It is also worth pointing out that France forced Haiti to pay France back for the lost property in slaves in the 19th century. In 1825, France sent the Navy to essentially force for Haiti to pay them back for their own freedom. The amount of debt that Haiti therefore owed to France foreclosed much possibility for economic development within Haiti itself. The total compensation was about $21 billion in today's money. It was only in 1893 that the French government agreed that they had been paid off. Again, Haiti is being forced to pay for its own freedom. It's being able to put a price on the price of the human beings who had relieved themselves of slavery. So why is Haiti in such a problem today? Because Europeans and the United States have placed conditions on Haiti's own independent uh, uh, own independence that have caused its problems. Um, so I would encourage you um, going forward to think about uh, um, the very complex reasons why Haiti is what it is today, both um, for what it can teach us, 
uh, uh, about ourselves and for what it can teach us about uh, the power of the Haitians uh, themselves. Thank you very much. I will see you next week.